Are you struggling with how to help your child strive for happiness and success? Today we get to talk about how do we help our children find happiness? Fact. Mom! Being a mom is really hard. Also a fact, Diet Dr. Pepper really helps. But if you're going to have the most important job in the world, I guess we should expect it to be hard. I'd be lying if I said I haven't considered jumping off the washing machine a couple of times. But we want you to know... You're doing better than you think. We're here to give you permission to give yourself a break. We all need love and support and laughter. Your family is looking up. I love you, Mommy. We are so excited to be back with you this week on Family Looking Up. This is Camille. This is Beth. This is Andrea. We are talking today to... Some former guests Ooh, of ours. Oh, good ones. And they were some of my favorites. We're going to be talking to William Sticksrood, PhD, and Ned Johnson. Yay. They're fantastic. Yeah. Really good. We're yeah. excited. Before we talk to them, though, we've got to talk about death. We oh. really do. I've been having a vision. Yes. I've why we have dream. to bring this up today, but for some reason we are on this topic. I know. Well, just... I'll tell you why. Because we just were talking about yoga with our last guest, and then we got on. We're oh. looking at yoga videos, but one of the ladies had died, and then she'd been cremated. So then Beth and I started to talk about cremation, and now here we are. Here oh, we are. Okay. I was out of the room for this yes. progression. I get it oh, now. Okay. okay. Yes. So we're talking about cremation, and like, I don't know. Do you like it? Do you not like I'm it? I'm like, oh, I think it's weird. Weird. I don't know. I, yeah. I I like the body. She's a body person. I, I love the body. She no. <laughs> <laughs> this is what and I was saying like, I just don't I think I just don't feel the same about death as a lot of people like I don't like I don't need all that viewing and all the mm-hmm. things and the sad songs like I want a party. And I'm not joking. Like I think people say I want a party. And they like don't mean it. They want and then everyone crying. like whispers. Yeah, and, and I'm like, no, I cries. want a party, but this is my dream. Okay, okay picture Anna Green Gables. Okay. okay, I'm with you with like flowers and her arms crossed. Okay. The lady, what is it? The lady, the lady of the lake, or the, the yeah, lady like, of the I lake? That's something it. Something like that. Yeah, okay. Like, okay, okay, so mm-hmm. Anna Green Gables. So I just want to be. Feel I just want to be laying music. there. Mm-hmm. With what music am I going to have playing from Hunger You're going to have the Hunger Games music when, when Rue dies. Okay, playing. My kids lash together some logs. Lay me upon them and then push me down a lake (laughs) into a a gently flowing stream. And then my brothers light arrows. Perfect. Whoosh. (laughs) Send them onto my body. (laughs) Boom. And that song keep going. And then deep in the middle. (laughs) And then under a willow. (laughs) And then that fades out, and Zumba movie music kicks up. Yo, that, that's good, baby. And then everybody dancing. Let's everybody go, dancing. let's go. And then it's just a big party. And then Danny's so sweet and quiet. He'll just stand there playing. Danny's standing there weeping with tears. <laughs> and I'd be like, getting lost Paige, in his beard. I'll just tell Paige on my death, or on my deathbed, Paigey. Just tell your father to pull himself together. He's going to be party. standing there deep in the meadow. <laughs> 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 in the meantime, Pitbull is blaring from the speakers. Uh. And everyone's doing Zumba. Uh. Let's go, Yes. Wouldn't that be such a great That film? would be an epic I will come funeral. to your funeral. So yes, fun. I would too. I'll be dead first. And then, but I'll come no, anyway. You don't know. You don't know. I'll be dancing as and a spirit. Then, <laughs> and then food. Oh. Just oh, yeah. so, so much, much food. food. Like all yes. the best fattiest food With just like grease dripping oh. down us as we <laughs> dance to pitbull <laughs> oh and then Gosh. we just start tearing limbs off animals and eating just, them raw. Oh. <laughs> you just want a viking funeral that is it what sounds you want. like I think I do. you know i'll start growing a beard now okay it'll be amazing by the time I, we get there i am committed from this day forth to never pluck again okay <laughs> We will take a solemn oath that we will never pluck again in preparation for your Viking funeral. <laughs> We're going to have a moment here. Oh, no. In 50 years when I'm deed, it will be so nice. When you're it. deed. Your brothers are going to be like, Beth's not looking so good. It's time to grow the beard. <laughs> Let's do it. The, the, the thing is, I'm going to have to like... Dip my dress in gasoline first. I'm realizing because the flaming arrows, yeah, 
They're going to need something more flammable. No, you cover it with like weeds and like dried flowers. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so there's flammable things. You're so probably going like to need to leave the country too. I think there's a, well, a law be, about this. They'll be in a Scandinavian place. She's going right? to be in Norway. Is it is it legal in Norway? Do, Most do we likely. Any, yeah, probably. Do we have any Norwegians in the house? Can you tell me if I can be burnt on a lake? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is there a lake anywhere in the world on which she can be burned? <laughs> and also we'll need some speakers. <laughs> <laughs> loud music in, loud, a lot I'm of good market. pumping pit bull music and cheesecake and need a party greasy box, so animal like legs flash while the music's yeah. going mm. and like mm. the biggest chartreuse board or however you say it you oh, ever okay. yes yes just meat so much meat and cheese and, and, crackers. and turkey little legs. cherry oh, tomatoes Jerry, oh oh the mozzarella oh the mozzarella <laughs> I don't even, I just can't wait till I die. I just feel <laughs> like this is going to be amazing. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I got to like dream up my own death now. Yeah. You know, my mom, I have to say, my mom was so dramatic her whole life. Yeah. Like she loved drama. She was a drama major. She loved old movies. I've seen all Gregory Peck and all Cary Grant and all the movies. All the okay. Movies. And when she died, it was... Such a summer day, like for her funeral, I mean, not the day she died. I don't remember that. The day she died was but, very sunny. Yeah, and happy. but for her funeral, it was this very sunny day. We go to the cemetery, absolute sunshine, cloudless sky. The hearse pulls up. These black clouds come out <laughs> of nowhere. Oh, all so my, like my oldest son and the nephews all go up to get the casket out of the hearse to bring it to the plot. And it downpours. And it downpours from the moment they pick up her casket until the moment they set it down. And then, boom, back to summer day. Your mom. And I was like, mom. You do It just wasn't quite dramatic enough <laughs> of a death, was it? So you had to have the thunder. Uh. And they all got soaked. And then they were dry within two minutes because it was so hot. It was June. So... That was like so perfect though. Like all of us were like laughing about it because we we're like, mom, oh my gosh. You. You. So you. I just like I just like a good dose of drama here. That's it. Yeah, I know. So we'll I want. we'll, we'll sing all of the and I want Deep the flowers. In the meadow. <laughs> I don't even remember. I don't remember that song. Oh, I, I do. Deep in okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> That's the only two lines I remember. That's why I only sing that. Oh, okay. oh that's why. <laughs> I thought maybe it was just one of those things that repeat. No. Okay. No, that's it. Well, does anyone have any other death things or maybe like an I'd marry that? Mm, death and I'd marry that goes hand in hand. Mm. I'd marry that um, casket. Mm. Mm. Some good caskets. I did see this amazing, you know how people do memorial benches? Yes. Yes. You know. Personally, I don't get you it. You don't want to be sat on. I don't want to be sat on. Like, yeah. don't put a bench with Beth on it. That's it. And then sit on it. <laughs> yeah. So there was this bench. So in memory of someone, I have no idea who it was. I just saw the bench. And it was like his name, his date, and then it said, he loved monkeys. <laughs> and I was like, that's all you could think? Like, there was this, like, cartoon monkey, and it was like, Bill Nye, June 15th, whatever. He loved monkeys. And I'm like... <laughs> okay i'm like were your kids desperate like okay what can we say about dad he was a nice dad he was kind of mean it It was Um, he worked a lot he no he didn't earn any money monkeys though didn't he he did love monkeys (laughs) let's go with he loved monkeys just that simple it just sums him up okay i have a great one when we went to ireland now you guys want to you know what cake wrecks are Right? Cake Rex? Cake Rex. Like cakes that wreck in an No, accident? no, 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 no. There is a website called Cake Rex, and she's made books. What is she saying? I don't okay, even listen know. Listen to Rex? me. No, cake, cake Rex. Rex. Like a wrecked car. Okay. But in cake form. Okay. Okay. Oh. Cake. Like a cake fell. Okay, yeah. Like a cake fell. Okay. Like, Thank nailed you. It. Nailed it. Okay, yeah. Mic drop, but not. Yeah, got okay. It. okay. So she started as a website. You should go look it up. They, it's so funny. I feel like you've told and then, me about this. Okay, maybe the I told memory. this story, but I'm telling know. you again. Yeah. So then so she's made books out of it because it was so wildly popular. Okay. Uh-huh. And so she, it's just like the most ridiculously bad, misspelled or badly written cake, like yeah. decorating, right? Uh-huh. So um, we went to Ireland and we found 
the cake wrecks of gravestones. Oh. We're walking through this old cemetery in uh-huh. Ireland. We're looking for one of our ancestors. And Alan starts laughing so hard. And we're like, odd time. Because we're here, <laughs> here we are in, a cemetery. in this cemetery. But he's like, come here, come here. So here's this, here's this cemetery, or this gravestone. Here lies whatever her name was, who died March 1st, 1534. No, it was November 22nd. <laughs> I was like, seriously? You like that had to be chipped in. Why don't you just cross like it was it so out? Yes, that's what I said. Just cross it out, little chipped. No, no. They wrote a whole nother sentence no. because they got the date wrong. No, it was November 22nd. <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's yeah. awesome. That was awesome. Which reminded me of another tombstone. Okay, there we go. There we go. I'm in the graveyard. How often do you go in the graveyard? <laughs> Frequently, I guess. I guess. Good I was, inspiration there. I was in a, in a graveyard and there was, I was actually visiting my nephew Jack. So I was with my brother and my sister in law. And they were like, you you need to come see this headstone. Because they're in there a lot, too, right. visiting yes. their son. And so they actually pointed this out to me. And, and it was this boy. I don't know his name, of course. But he was like 13 years old. Okay. So like recent. Like he'd passed away in yeah. the last year or so. And, oh, okay. And the dates were like a 13-year-old. And on the back, in bold letters quoted, that's what she said. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. He must have loved that phrase he must. so much that his parents had no choice. Like, well, you know that's all he said. What you I know. We're what, yep. What's something that just describes him? That's, that's what, it. That's it. I had a cousin. He has, I still have a cousin. I have a cousin who um, has pretty severe autism. And so family reunions, we'd all be together. And that boy from far away would hear people's conversations. And you'd say, you know, like, I'm too tired or, you know, anything. Yeah. Just talking to an uncle way across way the field. across. And Johnny would be like, that's what she said. And he'd be like, <laughs> how did you hear that? Like, he would, just, he would just enter a conversation. That's what she said. He's in a church house Johnny. yelling across. <laughs> that's what she <laughs> said. It was so funny because he'd come out of nowhere, nowhere or just be so far away. And you would say something and it fit perfect every time. But it was like. All right, thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny's in the house. <laughs> so funny. Um, oh, awesome. death. What a thing, huh? So funny. That it's is so funny. Hilarious. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the best guests we've ever had on were a terrific duo, William Sticksrude and Ned Johnson, who were authors of the book Raising Self-Driven Children. They Great were book. on episode 118, and we loved them. Anyway, they've written another book called What Do You Say? How to Talk to Kids to How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance and a Happy happy Home. So they're going to be on with us today. And you know what we're going to talk about? Probably death. We are going to talk about death. We're going to talk (laughs) about their book. (laughs) What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about how parents can talk to their kids about the pursuit of happiness and success without defining narrowly what that means. Oh. In other words, being open to what the kids' visions are instead of if, just shutting them down. What if they're wrong? All I right. don't know. Let's ask them what if they're wrong. Okay. Let's ask them those Let's questions. All right. Let's ask them. All right. William Sticksrud, PhD, is a clinical neuropsychologist and a faculty member at, a children, at Children's National Medical Center and George Washington University Medical School. Ned Johnson is the founder of Prep Matters, a sought-after speaker, and a teen coach for study skills, parent-teen dynamics, and anxiety management. His work has been featured on NPR, NewsHour, U.S. News & World Report, Time, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. They're incredible. Yeah. Let's listen in to what they have to say. This is going to be awesome. We're so happy today to have William Sticksrude, PhD, and Ned Johnson with us today on the podcast. They were with us during episode 118 on raising self-driven children. We're thrilled to have them back. Welcome. Nice to be here. So we just would love, because those who may not have heard you before, will you just give a quick introduction of yourselves for our audience? 
So this is Bill, and I'm a neuropsychologist, and I make a living I have for the last 37 years testing kids uh, who are having emotional problems or learning problems or attention problems or social problems, and I'm trying to figure out what's going wrong, what's going right, and how to help them. And I had the great pleasure of, of, of publishing a book with Ned in 2018 called The Self-Driven Child. In the last three and a half years, we, we spent a ton of time uh, talking with various audiences about the ideas in, in our first book. Fantastic. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a test prep geek. I've spent all my professional years since uh, 1993 uh, helping kids prepare for them that will, the alphabet of standardized tests for SAT and ACT and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I am the proud father of a 17 year old senior in high school, my daughter, and my son, who is a 19 year old student in college. Awesome. Fantastic. You have some experience with kids who have tested. <laughs> <laughs> you are both just such an incredible duo together. You put together a, fans, a fascinating team that looks at different aspects of of development and what helps and hurts kids as they grow up. And it's oftentimes counterintuitive. What we think is going to be helpful actually ends up being stressful and harmful to them. So I, we've enjoyed um, reading things that you've published, but why don't you tell us about your newest book? What did you say? So um, after, I guess about a year after the self-driven child came out, our, our agent actually said, I want you to write a second book about how to talk with kids. There, there, people really like all the language, all the dialogues in the first book. Just give them more. Try to make it easier for for for, him, for them to do to communicate with their kids and really to to raise self driven kids. And Ned and I have been talking with kids for sixty five years between the two of us at least, and uh, we, we could probably do that. <laughs> I it's wonderful. And so, <clears throat> what we want to focus on today is how, in speaking about speaking to our kids and communicating to our kids, how can parents talk to their kids about pursuing happiness and success without narrowly defining that in a way that kind of uh, pigeonholes that kid and defining for them what happiness means? How, how are we able to talk about that, that with them without absolutely making what we say the definition of it? Well, it probably starts with sort of broadening our our understanding and then and doing that with and for our kids of what happiness means. But Bill was given a talk in a school, an uh, independent school in Texas, and talking with a bunch of 10th grade student government kids and asked them, how many of you want to be happy as, as adults? And they all sort of raised their hands like, duh. And he said, well, oh, great. Well, what do, they, what do grownups tell you is necessary to be happy as an adult? And the kid says, well, they, they tell us if you get into a good enough college, then everything else will fall into place. And that would be lovely, except it's just palpably, palpably wrong. We, yeah. you know, if, if, if for no other reason, you know, if that were the case, then students at Yale would be among the most happy people in the universe, as opposed to being, you know, anxious and, and depressed and, and, and oversubscribing that class by Lori Santos on happiness because they've achieved everything, but they really don't know yet how to do to be happy. And so we stumbled on we look, when we started looking at what do we know about happiness, uh, and one of the people, Billy, maybe you want to talk about Martin Seligman and his great work? Well, yeah, and, and you know, we, we see so many unhappy kids, and, and they're, they're, people are talking about a pandemic of anxiety disorders and depression and self-injury and, and substance abuse in, in, in adolescents and even in children before the pandemic. And, and, it's, and, and these things have intensified in, in, in many populations, part of the population uh, since the pandemic. And we, we thought, well, you know, we, we set the bar too low. We, th we think, how, how, do we, how do we treat this depression? How do we make them less anxious? As opposed to, how do we help kids really understand what it takes to be happy? And for us, being happy is a big deal. I mean, it, it's really good for you. It's good for everything. It's good for your, your happiness. It's good for your health. It's good for your career success. It's good for your relationships. And we want kids to set the bar higher. And as Ned said, one of the guys who really uh, led the, the, all this research on, on what, what makes people happy is Martin Seligman, who pointed out around the, 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 the turn of the century that, that 
that his psychology historically had just studied misery. You know, what makes why are people so miserable? Why don't we study happy people and find out what <laughs> makes them happy? <laughs> Good you know? point. <laughs> and, 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 and basically, I mean, a lot of people have, have different angles on this, but Seligman really is, is the top guy in this field. He, he created the field of positive psychology, studying the positive aspects of human experience. And he said, basically, it's this formula. We, 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 can, we can summarize what makes people happy with the acronym PERMA. And it stands for positive emotion, engagement, that flow experience of deep engagement, what you're doing, relationships, meaning, doing things that are meaningful, and accomplishment. And accomplishment is part of it, but it's only one fifth of the formula. And, and the message that most of the kids that we work with get is that accomplishment is 95% of the formula. And the other things are, are, are okay, but 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 don't don't let them interfere with that pursuit of the 95th, that, 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 that 95% achievement. Hmm. That's interesting. It's fascinating because it it seems that we really don't have any idea at all what makes us happy. <laughs> Generally <laughs> speaking, I'm not happy. like really, I think that the the messages that we send to our children are like you said: do well in school, go to college. There you go. That's that, and you're going to be fine. And I I feel like so much of the world that we live in, social media. Many, many things about the world we live in intrinsically lead to anxiety and depression. And we don't really have a good grasp on what makes us happy. The lay person. I mean, you know, obviously, like, you understand. The genius is among it. us. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you guys right. know. But those of us with a very average IQ are so well, confused. Yeah, we're so confused. Yeah. yeah well, well, even the little people can understand. <laughs> 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 you know? but, but, I mean, you're, you're right. That one of the things that, that people who study happiness find is that we're terrible at predicting what's going to make us happy. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, we, we, th- we think that if, if, we, if somebody gives us money, we're going to be happier than if we give it to somebody else. We're actually, we feel happier if we give it to somebody else. We're happier if we focus on what we have as opposed to struggling to try to get what we don't have. There's so many things about happiness that are counterintuitive. And this is partly what we, it's not like we want to sit down and give kids a lecture, although that's what they do at Yale. This is Lori Santos' most popular course in the history of Yale University teaches kids the science of happiness. And these kids who've been, who got into Yale are desperate to understand why am I so miserable? How can I be happier? Mm. And we're, we're thinking, let's get, let's get started on this earlier. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, so let's start talking about this. Well, yeah, gonna, I mean, part of it is, is, um, you know, this uh, the point about why we're so terrible at predicting what will make us happy. Some of this is rooted in neurotransmitters. And so so in the middle of writing this book, I was just sort of, you know, idling away an afternoon doing yard work and just kind of thinking, is there like a difference between happiness and pleasure? And it turns out there is. Of course, some people, you know, much smarter than I have already been studying this stuff. Happiness, sorry, pleasure, we always think that, Pleasure is going to bring us lasting happiness, but it doesn't. And here's why. When we experience pleasure, it's the neurotransmitter of dopamine, which was released in the anticipation of rewards. So we, when you, you're about to open a present, right, you, you're looking forward to going on a vacation, right? You anticipate, you know, t- talking with someone who's really cute. You eat a chocolate chip cookie, right? You, you win a video game. You're about to score a goal. All these things, boom, dopamine, 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 dopamine. And they feel great. It's pleasure. Cocaine. Woo-hoo, not going to encourage that, but you get the idea. <laughs> and the problem is it doesn't last. And... It becomes, because dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter, our brain has to down-regulate how many receptors we have because you can't be excited like this all the time. Your brain will just sort of fly. And this is what addiction looks like, where Mm -hmm. happiness is rooted in a different mix of, of neurotransmitters, principally serotonin. And it's simply the subjective, ethereal subjective sense of everything's right in the world. Right. And so th- those are the days when you're you're out with your you know, you're on a vacation with your family, you're walking with your spouse, with your kid, with your dog. It's a beautiful blue sky day. You don't have any major stresses and you just feel at peace with the world. And you're walking along with the dopiest of grins and people ask, what's up? And you're like, nothing. <laughs> what's wrong with that person? And it's just this sense of things are right in the world. And so it's really hard to put your finger on that as opposed to if I win this award, I was the valedictorian, I got a raise, I got a new car. And it's not that 
those things don't bring us some pleasure, some happiness, but goodness, as Bill points out, if it's one fifth of the equation and you get on this hamster wheel of, a, of accomplishment and achievement and, the, and this, this dopamine hit, you know, uh, of, of addiction and you, you, we, I mean, Bill and I have both worked with people, a couple billionaires we know who have everything in the world, everything you can imagine, their own islands, their own everything, except for peace and happiness. Because they have swept away, swept aside things that are meaning, they've sacrificed relationships, and it's all just driven, 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 driven to achieve. And if that's your jam, okay, rock on. But goodness knows we're doing an incredible disservice to young people if we give them the, the messages, the, the wrong messages, that if you achieve enough that everything will, will be happy, because it's just not so. Wow. That's a really interesting thing. And I mean, just for clarification purposes, so the serotonin hit of happiness, that doesn't go away. As far as like the dopamine where you burn out, the serotonin is long lasting. And part of it, because you can just think about it, right? You can just sit there and think, you know, think about your spouse or, or that time you went, had a conversation with grandma and, and it just lives in you. I mean, my wife, my wife is, we're both, she's approaching 50 and she's been playing in this, this kind of community orchestra since she was like right out of college. And one of her goals is to play in this orchestra with her. And she describes it, her orchestra spouse, this wonderful guy named Art. Her goal is to play in this orchestra with Art until they're into their 80s, right? She is like fourth, 17th chair, whatever, second violin. She's not, she, nobody's watching her. She's not, she's not the soloist. And she, but she does it because she's deeply engaged in the music. She loves the people who are in this orchestra, and they're just one big family, right? And and, and she, I mean, there's no there's no accomplishment there. It's not like they're competing. <laughs> it's not like just going to get written up in the paper. But goodness knows, you have to do a lot to drag her away from orchestra rehearsal because it just makes her happy. Mm -hmm. We are going to take a quick break to make sure that you know about Patreon. If you're looking for some more content, some more laughter, you want to see what it looks like behind the scenes, then head on over to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and you can become a Patreon member. When you become a Patreon member of $5 or more, you will get to see all of our intros in video form and occasionally some bonus content. So if you want to know what really happens, the uncut version, head on over and go support us on Patreon. And now back to our episode. You know, this is not the message that we are learning from social media. This is not the message that we are kind of being taught in our, our achievement-driven society. And so how do we shift this as we are raising our kids? How do we shift that focus? And I know I definitely get caught up in it like, okay, we're going to win this game. Or, you know, you, you do get caught up in those things because there is such a, that feeling of victory is such a pleasure to have. I'm, I'm using the well, word pleasure because like you used it. it's like concrete too. It's like yes. you can, it's you can just the idea of something. like, go find something you love to do feels yes. very scary abstract. and yeah. abstract, mm -hmm. but it's like win the trophy and that will be it. You yeah. know, it's, you can, you can grab. Yeah, so how do you transition? How do you transition to more meaningful, long lasting search for happiness? Well, I mean, people, people who love sports in part, they love, they love the competition and there's nothing wrong with that. You know that, that 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 can give you that experience of deep engagement. You know, and and, I, and we're all for that. And and sports. I mean, when you're competing, it, it's you want to win, and that, and that that that's right. That's the way sports are, are supposed to be. And, and it's it's interesting because uh, in the book we talk about materialism, and uh, I think that there's been this which which means basically pursuing you know, wealth, money, status, power. Uh, looks and thinking that these things are the really important things. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. It's just that the research indicates if that's our goal, if we per if that's our primary pursuit of, of, of these materialistic things, that it makes us unhappy. And so part of it is is is, is not not discouraging kids from, from doing sports or competing and that kind of stuff or, or doing the things that are pleasurable, but also just to, to, to be basically get them the message that that deep, I love that deep engagement. Even if it's not something, even if it's not something that's going to give you a college scholarship, you know, I, I love, I love how passionately you build with Legos. It's so fun for me to watch you do this thing that I just know you're completely in the zone. And also talking about our own experience of engagement. I'm, I'm, 
I'm I'm a rock and roll uh, a musician, and I, I and when my kids were younger, I I I'd, I'd say stuff like, you know, I I went down to the basement this morning to learn to learn this guitar solo, and I thought I was down there for about forty five minutes. I came back upstairs. I've been there for two and a half friggin' hours. <laughs> You know, and, and I, I didn't kind of know where I, I was so deeply engaged. And that, that's part of that's part of this formula, that deep engagement. And we want kids to know that we support it. And certainly what comes up a lot is, well, many, many kids get that primarily through video games. We want to say, OK, that, that, that's great. And, 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 and I but ideally, there's some other things, too, that besides video games that, that they get it from. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the deep engagement, or, or we, we talk about how we, we model how important our relationships Right. And I would say with video games, the, the great th- thing about video games in the last decade is they become increasingly social, right? They, they'd be small because the technology is so much more sophisticated that people can carry on and, and play these games, you know, in, in a really, you know, um, in a very social way. Um, you know, and I think part of it, we ask about how do we, sh- how do we share this with kids? Part of this, we just model this for you know, we model this ourselves, right? You know, to, to really just talk about, you know, gosh, I can't wait until Sunday. I'm going for, you know, I'm going to be hanging out with, with, with the guys and really looking for that softball game. Or we love watching sports together. Or, you know, my, my wife, you know, is teaching a bunch of her friends how to knit, right? You know, I, I this, um, this, this summer, actually the summer when we were working on this book and, and was reflecting on this chapter, happiness chapter, and I finally put my finger on it. And I, I said this to my kids. I said, you know what makes me happiest in the world? apart from, you know, being with my family, I said, it's feeling like I'm helping people. Now, I'm materialistic, too. I mean, I like a good bottle of wine. And it's, it's not it's not, it's not money is a problem. Right? It's the love of money, right? You know, that's you know, the, the, just driven, 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 driven. But I think for all of us, if we can, as adults, when we can really pay attention to what makes us happy, and 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 show this to our kids and talk it out loud. I can't wait. I love it. It was so good to just spend time and two hours of coffee. And gosh, we laugh like no this business. I haven't seen seen Don for 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 weeks, and was, I just gosh, it reminded me how much I just love his company. Right. I mean, I have a family I was working with who just <laughs> they sat down with me at the start of her sophomore year and explained to me the seven figures of donation that they'd made to an Ivy League school and how they intent was the girl to go to this. And so. Dad, Telling me about you know the grades and all sorts and all this kind of thing, and then he says, "But God, all she wants to do is play soccer and hang with her friends. I mean, really, what's the point? It's not like she's going to be a recruited athlete." And I'm like, "One, <laughs> how she likes it, right? <laughs> and two, that she goes to this pressure cooker school, and it's so it's just really hard." And I'm like, "But but sports are incredible. It can be an incredibly healthy way to be engaged and to blow off stress." And friends, an incredibly important part of life and a way to blow off stress. And so if you want her to be able to work really hard at these all these classes, apparently just for the purpose of getting an A to get you in it, we want to have things that she actually enjoys just for the sake of enjoying it. I mean, Bill and I have a mutual client um, who is this absurdly talented young woman, absurd and everything she touches is unbelievable. Um, at also at this very, uh, very intense school. And they sat down with me before she started high school and asked my advice. Should she do this advanced class or that advanced class? Back and forth and back and forth. And they showed me, um, I'll see if I can find this. They showed me this artwork that she had done. And your viewers, uh, listeners can't look at this, but you guys can look at this. This is what she did when she was like 12. Oh, my oh, gosh. Wow. I could spend the rest of my life doing this. This would never happen. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Unbelievable. And I said, I said, here's my one piece of advice. This beautiful art that she does, don't let her do it for competition. Don't submit it for anything. Let this unbelievable ability that she has be simply for her to have joy in her life and to share it with people who, when she wants to bring joy into their lives. Don't take what's a, a, a natural, her passionate pursuit and turn it into a competition for college. Hmm. Huh. That's great. That yeah. is. And that's really hard though, right? You see your kid excelling at something and you're like, yes, finally, a useless, a useful child. They can, <laughs> they can sell this. They can do something with it. Like, that's, the thing, 
<laughs> That's the thing you want to push them into most. Like, this is your natural gift. Let's yeah. do something with it. And you it. feel Let's like you're helping them. Serve yeah. the world with sure. it. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it, it's the, the kind of the, the, the kind of kids that, that Ned is talking about, these, these very perfectionistic kids who will turn everything into a competition that they have to be the best at. I mean, I think that they require some special handling. And I think Ned's advice is really good advice. Yeah. And I think I think also that this idea of meaning is something that that as, as we we're thinking of writing this book, that this what do you say, that it just struck us as really important to be th- talking with kids about because so many kids have the experience of just what, what high school is is just jumping through the hoops, and and that that, that we ask is what's really important to them is well I don't I don't know I think it gets me into college, and. That, that's not you, you see you see how many success, ultra successful people students and, and adults commit suicide oh yeah and and, and you realize that that, that 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 kind of achievement that that's not exactly the formula <laughs> that depression and and suicidality don't respect achievement and so I think that the meaning piece I mean it's just these studies where, where kids are really anxious about taking a test and if they simply, spend five minutes writing about their highest values, something that's really important to them. They're much less anxious taking the test because just that when, they, when they're reflecting their highest values, it just doesn't seem like that big a deal where they get an A or a B or a C on, on the test. And, and, and we just don't focus enough on really the things that kids value, the kids that are meaningful to them. Uh, and, and help them keep the rest of their life in perspective. And I think it, in, in part because we have trouble remembering you know, you know, what's what's really important. And we, we focus on uh, that, that keep that spotlight on achievement in college admissions as if where you go to college uh, is the is the most important outcome of childhood and adolescence, which we think is a huge mistake. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. These parents don't sound like me. <laughs> like, like that's what's important. Get to the best college. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't even help you with fourth grade math. Let's not go to the best college. Like, we did just have an interesting experience with my son in the piano. He's really naturally good at the piano. Like he hasn't taken many lessons, but he can play things really well and easily. And I want to be like, wow, this is so great. Let's practice more. Let's go to more lessons. You know, like just naturally, I want to push him towards that. And he was supposed to do a recital next Sunday. And the practice was this week and he melted down like he was going to lose his mind if I made him do this recital like he I'm quitting piano I hate this I'm not going just tell my teacher I quit and I wanted to just be like just do it like you're great you're good and push and push and push luckily I have a husband who's wiser than me and was like a recital's not worth it like piano is something you can do forever if he quits because of one recital like why can't he just play to play and I was like oh it, is that a is that a mm-hmm. possibility? Like, aren't are we letting him be a slacker? Are we making um you know whatever? And he's like, no, maybe we're just letting him play to play. And so we went and talked to him, and he's he doesn't want to do this. And we're like, you know what? You don't have to do the recital. Just talk to us about it, and let's tell your teacher you don't have to do it. He was back back to the piano the next day, playing and ready to go to his lessons. And it was a really interesting like. Hmm. Why why take that love away from him mm-hmm. just because here's this opportunity to showcase it? Yeah. He could just play to play and it's a skill he can have forever if I don't ruin it for him and push him into this thing. Hmm. Right. Right. I was going to say, it's such a good point because you know, what we talk about in the first book is, well, in, in the both book, we talk about self-determination there, which is a model of intrinsic motivation because when we, 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 this is all in the in, in this book, the, the language of, 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 of motivation, right? And the, the key thing that we should think about is more than wanting our kids to work hard at music, at sports, at school, we want them to want to work hard, right? Because we can only push people so much before they go, forget it, I'm, 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 I'm checking out on, you know, on music, on school, on, on, on life. And the model for, for kids, for anyone to be intrinsically motivated, there are three psychological needs that have to be met. One, competency, so that's why practice matters. Two, relatedness, which is I love watching it. Gosh, it's so fun, right? Your, your, your son loves his teacher. And three, autonomy, that he's approaching this in a way that works for him, you know, so that it's, 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 it's kid-driven and adult-supported, not, not, not the other way around. Um, so I think I, I, I'm glad you guys, you know, were able to come to a, a place that worked well because, yeah, you want him to love to play the piano because guess what? The more he loves it, the more he's going to practice it. Where we so often think the more he practices, the more he's going to love it. I see it more. Right. Mm. 
Interesting. That's good. So how do you balance that? Like I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, you know what? That's that's really great. Like that yeah. you can teach him to love piano just to love it and not have to feel the stress of performing. But how do you balance that teaching your kids that they can do hard things? Like, you know, I don't, you don't want your kids to every little thing think, oh, I don't want to do it. It causes stress. So I'm just not going to do it because that's not enjoyable. There is a sense of joy mm-hmm. in accomplishing. How mm-hmm. do you reach past that? Well, we would focus on, I mean, about, and parenthetically, in the first book, I mentioned that, that, that I, I mean, I've always been grateful of my parents for letting me quit taking the piano, quit uh, piano lessons after, after about two or three months when I was nine. I didn't play at all. And, and, and then w- when the Beatles came out, like many people in my generation, I got in a band and I play and sing more than virtually anybody I know who is, who is forced to practice. Uh, but in any case, I think what we want to do is, is find out it, it, that there are kids who really want to do the recital, but they're just too anxious. Mm. And that there are kids who just don't. And, and we say, okay, that, 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 that you don't have to want to do that. But there are kids who want to do it. I, what I say to kids is if, if it didn't make you really anxious, or you, you felt like you had to handle the anxiety, would you want to do the recital? Mm-hmm. Because, because I, I don't want to be forcing stuff on kids or telling them you, you need to do, to do this. And certainly, but your point is very well taken, that the way kids develop what we call in our new book, high stress tolerance, and, the, and that, that, that ability to, to function well in stressful situations, the way they develop that is by doing it, you know, is, is by having the, the, the experience of I, I overcome that, I can handle this. That's what kids gives, gives kids confidence that they can handle hard stuff. And so, but we wanted, we, we, they're trying to force them to do it doesn't necessarily make sense. And uh, I think it is often counterintuitive, but, but asking them, if, 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 if it didn't make you so anxious, if you, or, you, or if you felt you could handle the anxiety, would you want to do this? Because it's possible that even though you might be really stressed, you aren't going to die. And then you, even though you might screw the stuff, screw some stuff up, you know nobody's going to nobody's going to tease you or laugh at you. And if you got through this, it, you might feel like it made me stronger. I, I can I know I can handle this. I didn't die. You, know, mm-hmm. you can have that kind of conversation even with quite young kids. But I think what, what but Ned and I are, are so focused on is trying to get buy in from kids so that we aren't we aren't trying to force and we aren't trying to lay stuff on them. Then you well, and only, you know, I won't go into the whole thing, but we, we, we talk about in the book something called motivational interviewing. One of the, um, one of the insights of it is that people are simply ambivalent about in, in change, but in this case, the piano recital, where your kid can't imagine a scenario where he goes up there and burns the house down like it's Elton John, you know, destroying a piano. <laughs> but he can also imagine where it's, you know, crickets and he forgets, flubs everything and he walks away in shame. And if it is, you know, as Bill points out, if it is anxiety, you know, we as parents have, have the first movie in our head and, and the kid has the second. And so when we sort of hold that middle space and recognize, you know, you probably have reasons to want to do this. You have reasons not to want to do this. When, when, we, when we go through that conversation and we don't, when we, when, when we argue one side of the equation, kids will reflect, reflexively argue the other. And when we acknowledge that there's pros and cons to this and so, gosh, is there a way that I can help? When, when anyone feels like they're understood and can be open about, yeah, it is kind of scary, it makes it much more likely that the thinking part of the brain, including the skills to put things into context, that they and put it into perspective, they can go, okay, I can see how I can, I can see how I can handle this. Would it be okay if I, like my daughter doesn't want to go to school, it almost always ends up with, could we go to Starbucks? And okay, fine, right? You know, and if that's what she needs to jumpstart in the morning. It's, from my perspective, it, it's collaborative problem solving because we don't want to we don't we want to support kids so that they can handle things that are a little bit intense because when they progressively do that, they build that stress tolerance and and we never get stronger by avoiding everything that's hard. But we also don't want to drop kids into the deep end of the pool if they if they're not ready and they're not prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Mm. I like that. Yeah, makes sense. I have a question about the P of PERMA in the positive emotion. Like I see a lot of like, okay, I can see how engaging in things they love would be really good and talking about meaningful things in our lives. But how do I convince a child to have any sort of positivity ever? <laughs> <laughs> be positive, I, dang I, it. <laughs> it's um, um, 100 lectures of... No, I'm teasing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sit them down and talk to them. Say she did. She's already up to 400. <laughs> you know, I mean, when we look at the research, about we think about 40 percent of this is it's just genetic, right? I mean, my son is 
is the most preternaturally upbeat, glass half full human being you could ever meet. It's just ridiculous, right? My daughter has, we'll say, a little bit more intensity. Um, and, and it's just the way that they're wired. And but still, there are all kinds of things that help, you know, being well rested, you know, it improves your, 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 your happiness. Your sleep deprivation certainly increases your unhappiness, this kind of negativity bias, right? You can read all the work of greater good out of, out of Berkeley, right, of, of the act simply of gratitude, right? You know, m- my favorite quote, and I'll throw it over to the neuroscientists here, the neuropsychologists among us, but William James, the great, you know, psychology, uh, founder of psychology at Harvard said, my experience consists of that which I choose to attend to. So you can go to a restaurant and be thrilled that you're there with the people, or you can be the whole time thinking, I, there's someone else has a better table. <laughs> right? so these, are, these, these, are, these are things that can be cultivated, and it may go back to what we as a family, I mean, you know, there's the reason why prayer, you know, to, you, you, know you count your blessings, right? And you, can, and you realize you have more than you might think. And I, I, what, we, what we suggest for a lot of this stuff is that we model and and or we we make it a family goal. I mean, I, that what what how how would it, what would it be like if we if we, if the family on on Friday night we have dinner together. We just we just to take, talk talk for a minute about about the stuff that that that, that worked well in our life, the stuff that we're, we're grateful for, or the th- the positive things. I, mean, I had this dramatic experience. When the first kid I ever did psychotherapy with, without supervision, she was a twelve year old who was really depressed. And just on the outs with all her friends, and I, I simply asked her to, to keep track of, of positive things that happened. And she came back the first week, said nothing. So we, we set the bar. So we set the, the bar lower, saying we keep track of stuff that didn't suck, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and and, um, and but eventually, within probably about six or seven weeks, she was keeping track of, of six, and then eight, and then ten, then twelve positive things that happened during your day. And after about eight weeks. She, she wasn't depressed anymore. What she noticed was actually she, she, people started to be more attracted to her because she wasn't such a sourpuss and she wasn't kind of so negative. And you know, certainly, as Ned said, it's easier for some people who, who have that kind of hit the genetic lottery and they're just, they just have this kind of this, this upbeat mood, positive disposition, glass half, half full kind of disposition. But as Ned said, there's so many things that we can do. To, to, to influence our, our, that positive emotion. And I think that, that a lot of, I know, I know a lot of families that, that routinely go, just let, they keep track. They have, they, they keep a, a gratitude log or they just talk about the stuff that went well. Did, 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 what, were the, what were the highlights of your day? Uh, that kind of thing. And I, I think that it's a really good practice. And certainly all, there's a huge literature on gratitude. Uh, that, that suggests that, that focusing on, on stuff, what we have and being grateful for it as opposed to resenting the stuff we don't have. Um, big deal. Incredible. That's really wonderful. I, you know, I hear again and again in all of your answers and thoughts that communication is key here. Modeling and communicating and listening and responding to what they're saying. And I just think too often we have in our mind, this is what you're supposed to be doing you're not meeting it. I'm going to push you harder um, because that's my job as a parent. And then we're surprised when they're not happy and we're not happy. <laughs> but I, I love that. I love the things that, well, that you one of the things, you know, Go we ahead, start in the, in the book making the point that if there's a silver bullet against the effects of stress on brains, particularly developing brains in, in, in young kids, it's having a close connection with a parent or another caregiver. And so in all the ways that life is hard, we want kids to grow up who are courageous in the face of challenge, who are resilient when things are stressful, who, who have to get up and go to get up and do stuff so that they're, they're motivating themselves, not needing to kick in the duff all, all the time. And, and, and parents are just an incredibly important part of that process. And we, we simply want parents to be effective in how they communicate and then the values that they communicate to kids. Because there's nothing more stressful than having great advice or important wisdom to share and have it get sort of thrown back up in your face. But we know that in terms of to be, to be effective, we, we really need to seek to understand kids, to, 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 to empathize and to validate the perspective. And it has the effect of sort of swooshing aside the stress that may be building up in them. And, and, and protects them, you know, it protects them against the effects of stress that do really bad things to developing brains, particularly when they, when they have long-term stress. 
And if I can make a comment about where we started with this idea of talking with kids about happiness without kind of laying on them a, 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 what, the require, what a model of happiness, they, they may not agree. I mean, I think Ned and I both, both think that the definitions of a successful life is a life you're happy with. You know, and 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 we, we, you know, how many people do we know who achieved and achieved and achieved, and they 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 they, they weren't happy, so they bought a farm someplace, you know, and and uh, yeah, you know, and, and I think that that I I want kids to have a life that they're happy with, and and I don't know, I don't know from the time they're very little what, what that's going to be, and so my job is not to lay some model of what I expect them to to, to how I expect them to turn out, but to help them to, to figure out who they want to be. And how to get there? From my from our point of view, that's our job as parents. It's it's not we don't know necessarily what's always in their best interest. We want them to, to, to practice making decisions, thinking about what's important to them. And it's not it's not that we 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 set we have a chapter in our book about setting limits and, and, it, and that we're the natural authorities in our family because we're older and we're smarter and we're not necessarily smarter, but we're more experienced. We have more wisdom about life than they do that we want to share with them. Um, but it's, it's not like somehow we're the experts on them. Yeah. We, we want them to be the experts on them. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end. That's pretty amazing. I love, I love the um, definition of a successful life yeah. that you gave us. That was. I feel like that needs to go on my wall. I do too. I really, I really <laughs> actually think we should put it up in this office. I think we should. I love it. I, I thought that was perfect. And some, a good reminder to parents, I encourage everybody to li- um, go and get their book. What did you say? It's, um, it's what do you say? Oh, sorry. What do you what say? What did you yeah. say? That's I, what you yelled at your son. What did you yes, say? Yeah, so right. yeah. What did you say? The book is yeah. what do you I'm so sorry. I wrote it down wrong. You like both titles. Um, I'm, no, I'm actually <laughs> illiterate. So if that happens. Um, thank you for correcting me, though. Um, encourage everybody to go get their book, What Do You Say? Um, and use the tips in there to develop even better relationships and help their kids find their happy life. So now we're going to transition and subject okay. both of you to something we make our guests do, mm-hmm. which is very exciting and not a definition of success or not, but we're going to be doing a speed round of questions with you. Oh, I remember I this. Think, yeah. Do you? Okay. <laughs> I remember. And I can't remember if you guys want to alternate questions or if you both answer each question. Yeah. What do you want to do? Your call. Well, we'll we'll both answer, but we'll alternate. We'll we'll alternate who goes first. Okay, right. there you go. okay. You guys like manage yourselves. All right, okay. I can't be pointing and telling whose turn it is. <laughs> yeah. okay. You are grown men. I'll start. Here. I'm in charge of answering okay. the question. All right. asking it. All right, ready? Yeah. Go. Ariel or Jasmine? Jasmine. <laughs> Dawn or dusk? Dawn. Do you snore? Nope. Place you most want to travel. New Zealand. Favorite junk food? Chocolate. Favorite childhood show? Ooh, Hong Kong Fooey. Ooh, <laughs> last Halloween costume? Uh, cat. Say, <laughs> say a word in Spanish. Hola. Favorite number? 11. Who has it easier, men or women? Oh, man. <laughs> yep, I asked it. Go ahead, answer it, sir. He said man. Oh, he Not did? Oh, man. Oh, he said, said man. Oh, man. There you go. <laughs> Have you worn socks with sandals? Say it again. Have you worn socks with sandals? Occasionally. <laughs> Not just once. <laughs> Pick up the newspaper. Oh, <laughs> I wasted your time because I thought you said, oh man, like this is such a tough answer. <laughs> we all know men have it easier. Oh, uh, that was awesome. All right. Now we love to get a challenge to our listeners, something simple that they can focus on this week to implement what we've talked about. Do you have something you could challenge them to do? Hmm. There is a... Uh... I have a podcast. I'm not, I'm not where you guys are, but a podcast. And I interviewed Michaeline Duclef has a wonderful book called Hunt, Gather, Parent. Uh, and she talked about, uh, she at one point did research where she, she studied, she recorded um, American parents and then some from some cultures around the world, more ancient cultures, and recorded how many instructions or orders or directives per hour the parents gave to kids. 
And in some of these other parts of the world, it was like three instructions an hour. And the American families that she followed, it was 75. Oh, whoa. <laughs> 75 an hour. So she applied this, and this was probably a little bit, no, sweetheart, but no, be careful, stop, but what, stop, 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 you know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So, uh-huh. she, so she has this adorable little rosy, you know, toe-headed, just adorable child. She kept, she showed up on her podcast, this little blonde curls is great. And she said, so I, I tested myself to say, I get three instructions an hour. And she said, so then at 11.02, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I can't talk the rest of the time. <laughs> and so what it did is it just, it made her be really thoughtful about, you know, what, what was really necessary, right? You know, even then she's got a toddler, right? And there are things that, that her daughter could pay attention to without her pointing them out. And so when she really saved her breath, one, her daughter was much more easygoing because she wasn't on edge all the time. She didn't have one eye on mom and one eye on the world. She was more attentive to the world. And she, and Michael Lee described, she, I was just so much more thoughtful about what, what did I really want to say to my daughter? What was really important and what was, it perfectly, what was she perfectly capable of and safe to figure out for herself? Hmm. I love that's that. Nice. That's so yeah, cool. that is really fascinating. As always, that. you are both just fascinating men. We sure appreciate you being on here. <laughs> and we want to give you a chance to um, tell our listeners where they can purchase your books, where they can find you on the internet. Can you just take a moment and tell them well, we, how they can take advantage of all that you have to offer? Well, we, you know, if you're interested in the book, which we, we hope you are, because as, as you noted, it has all these kind of scripts and kind of what to do tonight type of advice. Um, we are big fans of everyone's local independent bookstore, wherever you are in the world. Uh, if you have to, uh, that Bezos guys is trying to raise a little more cash to go to back in space. So you, know, <laughs> you can always do that. Um, <laughs> our, uh, on, on, we have a website, uh, selfdrivenchild.com, and then there you can hear about uh, uh, events and uh, things that are coming up and sign up for a, for a newsletter with us. Um, and then social media. Um, I, I do most of the social media because of my relative youth. Um, uh, <laughs> you make that all of the social media. <laughs> so, so there's, you know, Self Driven Child uh, on uh, the Facebook page and on Instagram. Um, you guys will appreciate this. About two weeks ago, I'm, I got talked into do, do, jumping onto TikTok because Ooh, you know, I'm, I love TikTok. I'm, I'm, I'm in my early 50s and I look like it. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a natural for this, right? <laughs> so, but but as a test prep geek, I have one skill that most people lack in that I can write upside down. So I made a TikTok video about something called the Yerkes Dotson curve. And it's simply some people perform better with, with little stress and some people with more stress and procrastinators, blah, blah, blah. And it went a little viral. And so we're it's just short of 1.5 million views right now. So um, so it, my TikTok mm-hmm. handle is the other Ned Johnson. Wow. <laughs> I am loving that. I'm checking that Don't out. Don't worry, I just a found your own TikTok. I'm here. It I'm locked in. already found yeah, it. I found Absolutely. Julie. <laughs> well, thank you so much for both taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today, for helping all of the parents listening to be able to communicate better with their kids and lead toward better happiness. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. What, what a pleasure. Very much our goal. They are brilliant. So wise. So they work with such a different population. Though. Oh, yeah. That's what whenever, when the both time we talked to him, I remembered like they're working with like the wealthy East Coast. Mm-hmm. East Coast. College is key. And we are very much like Western, large families. Community college is cool, too. <laughs> 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 well, and like, I mean, I say that jokingly. Of course, like, I want a good education for my children. It's just such a different. The things they say, the cutthroat. I'm like, man, yeah, I man. can't even. I think our yeah. kids are kind of at an advantage. Let's yeah. go West Siders. Yeah, yeah. yo, yo, West Side. <laughs> um, I do think it is fascinating, though. I love how counterintuitive their research is. Like, I feel like the more that we try to push our kids toward happiness. Mm-hmm the less happiness they feel. Yeah. yeah. And so it really is, this is why education is key. Um, you know, the more that we're able to find out how our psyche reacts to certain things, to certain pressures, the more we're able to understand how to help. So I just thought it was so funny when I said, we told Carson you didn't have to do the recital and Andrea was like, 
quit her. <laughs> Work harder. What? I saw it in her eyes. Like, oh yeah, she's not about that life. Like, but I felt. I think. I think there's good points on both sides of like. Well, no, that's there's too. I was curious For to sure. know what their opinion was of yeah, that because I was too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just all about. I mean, right? If we say everything's important. Everything has to, you have to just overcome. It's too much. And if you say, oh, you're scared, don't do it. Then it, you're also failing. Like there right. is mm-hmm. all about that balance of like, Absolutely. what is worth the fight? Like maybe it is and maybe it's not. And I think it's just between you and your spouse and your children and mm-hmm. figuring that all out. And of course you have a million kids with a million different needs. So it makes it real tricky. Yeah. I have a million but, and one. So it's trickier. Yes. But uh, don't yeah, know, don't I think you're right. me. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that it really comes down to communication. Yeah. Again and again, they talked about that. Well, if, as you interact with them and you ask them how they're feeling about this and if it's just this or that. Anyway, fascinating. Just read their books. Just, read their, just books. read their books. I'll tell you, I do not read a lot of nonfiction. And there's their self-driven child one is one of the few that I love. Yeah, it's great. It is really so, good. Yeah, go check those out and leave a review on Apple Podcasts for us if you haven't had a chance to do that. And we will see you next week.